All right, we are in uh, Matthew chapter 13. <clears throat> I haven't said that for very long. Hold on a minute while I fix something here. Matthew chapter 13. So uh, last week we kind of gave an introduction to the parables that uh, Jesus is getting into here now in chapter 13. This week we'll begin with the first one. Uh, the parable of the sower. So we'll be looking at verses 3 through 9 and then also verses 8 through 23. So 3 through 9, he gives the parable to the uh, multitude. And then in 18 through 23, uh, he explains the parable to his disciples. So we will do both of those things today, hopefully. All right, so uh, verse uh, chapter 13, verse 3. He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. So, again, I've got to just point out, he, he begins this whole thing with the word behold. Uh, in, in, um, in Mark, he actually says, hearken, hearken and behold. Uh, he really wants them to pay attention. This is something he's trying to get across to them. And, and again, when we see the word behold, he's, he's wanting us to pay attention. And he said, behold, a sower went out to sow. Uh, actually, the, the Greek is more specific. It says the sower went out to sow. Uh, the, the point is that th this is something very familiar to them, right? Uh, someone who, who sows their grain, uh, uh, you know, it, it may have been someone who is actually in view of the audience at that time, right? That they were, uh, remember, on the seashore uh, looking out at Jesus in the water. They could maybe look over their shoulder and see some fields that are planted or see actually someone sowing, but uh, it was certainly something not unfamiliar to them. And in that, in those days and times, most of the sowing was done by hand. Uh, you know, they, the, the sower would just take the, the handful of grain and throw it out into the, into the fields in order to, to grow. So it was, it was not uh, a mechanized system like you might think of today. Although I did read somewhere that, that they perhaps had some carts that they pulled that it would have a hole in the cart and then they would, uh, pull the uh, pull the seeds that way, but it was a very manual, uh, uh, labor-intensive kind of activity. All right, so when we get into uh, verse uh, four through uh, four through eight and nine, uh, we actually then look at the four different types of soil that this um, uh, that this uh, seed falls onto. And so we're going to take a minute and look at what it says here about uh, the way that those uh, four different soils are described. So verse four. Says, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the wayside, and the birds came and devoured it. So the wayside, uh, th these are uh, most probably paths uh, that were that separated the fields. They were, you know, in those days there were really, really no fences, no walls, uh, unless there were, you know, some natural rocks or something that were built up. But typically, uh, fields were just divided by paths. Uh, so in, in, these were. You know, dirt packed down, beaten down by people walking on it over and over. And so as he sowed the seeds, obviously he's not throwing them on that path, but some of it will end up there. And, uh, you know, th these seeds obviously would just lay on top of the soil. Uh, were easy prey then for the birds to come and, um, and pick them up, as he describes here. And Luke, it also says that they are trampled under a foot, um, you know, again, because these are on the paths. And so they're just going to be stomped down by people walking on those paths. So that's the description of the first kind of soil, the wayside soil, if you will. Now let's keep going and look at verse five and six. Some <clears throat> fell on stony places where they did not have much earth and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. So this stony soil or rocky soil uh, whatever it is, it had a, a very little earth. The, the the thought process here is that some of the soil, uh, you know, it, it didn't go, uh, the soil didn't go very deep. It, it hit a rock bed at some point, and so there was a very thin layer of soil on top of that rock bed. And so the the plants would uh, uh, would not have the opportunity really to put down roots, and so they would uh, take all their energy. And, and put it into springing up fast. Uh, so you'd have a plant that would grow very quickly, uh, that would spring up because all the energy uh, from the plant was being put into uh, uh, going up rather than going down. 
Uh, these plants typically were the first ones to uh, come out of the ground. They were, uh, you know, they, they looked pretty good, right? They, we got some really fast plants growing here, uh, but, uh, you know, you had this rock bed underneath the soil. And then, as it said, uh, you know, when the, when the sun came, uh, they had no root. They, they, they had no, uh, Luke adds that they had no moisture um, so that the, 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 uh, they would wither away very quickly. <clears throat> All right, and then we have verse seven. We have some fell among the thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Uh, a better word might be weeds rather than thorns. The, the point was that the soil was weedy, uh, was full of thorns. Uh, and these, uh, these uh, you know, the plants would come up, but then we would also have the weeds that would grow up with them. And also note that, the, you know, the weeds are the, the natural plants, right? They're the ones that uh, grow really well in that soil. Uh, whereas the seeds are, are you know, unnatural, uh, they, they require some attention. Uh, so the weeds, uh, they, they would take on all the moisture, the nutrients, the sun, uh, and they would take over the field and, and, and block out, as it says here, choke, the, choke out the, the seeds uh, that uh, the farmer was trying to, or the sower was trying to plant. And then finally, we have the good soil in verse 8. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. So now you've got some good soil, deep, soft, clean, uh, and you end up with this uh, really tremendous harvest. Um, typically, a good, uh, a good crop would be a tenfold harvest. And so when you're talking here about 30, 60, 100fold, these are uh, really good crops. Um, Back in Genesis, it talks about Isaac having a hundredfold crop and and saying that that was obviously blessed from the Lord to have a hundredfold crop. So, so these these were obviously really good uh, crops that were coming up if they would have a hundred sixty or even thirtyfold uh, uh, kind of yield on the on their crops. All right, then he ends the parable again. This is a, this is what he's sharing with the multitude. He ends it by saying, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." In other words, if you can understand this, then understand it. <laughs> only, only you who uh, have understanding, only you who, frankly, are related to the king, are going to understand this. And as we've seen before, after he he gives these parables, right? The you know, not only do the disciples ask in verse ten, you know, why do you speak to them in parables? They ask him if you go to Mark chapter four. They say, okay, you need to explain to us what these parables mean. And so that's where we. <clears throat> then we skip now over to verse 18 and look at the explanation of this parable that Jesus finally gives in verse 18. And mine says this, therefore, hear the parable or the sower or, you know, hear ye, hear ye the parable of the sower. Again, Jesus is trying to uh, emphasize this is important that you understand this parable. And he, and he has this kind of emphatic word at the front. Uh, therefore, here, mine says, but uh, or ye here or whatever it is in your in your translation. Uh, but the point is now is the time for you to understand what is being said. So before we get into the details of this, let me ask a couple of questions. Um, who is the sower? I'm sorry. We could be. We could be. Mm hmm. If you skip down to verse 37, we actually jump into a different parable here, the parable of the tares. In verse 37, uh, he says, he answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. So here the sower is, is defined as Jesus. Um, you know, but as David has said, that is uh, not, not the only sower. Uh, we, you know, anyone who sows this seed uh, can be the sower. Um, and, you know, and as, as we'll see as we get into this, we are supposed to be the sowers also. Um, because these uh, these parables were for the disciples, right? To help them as they went out and did their ministry. Uh, it, it was to give them an idea of what they were going to run into and frankly, give them encouragement uh, that, hey, you know, some of your seed is not going to end up in good places. Uh, some of it is not going to end up, uh, you know, returning much uh, to you. Uh, so, so the, the, there's no question here that the the sower uh, goes beyond just Jesus, who is obviously the first sower, uh, but it goes on to uh, all of the the disciples and, frankly, we as we uh, um, spread the seed. 
Now, what is the seed? Gospel. The gospel. Yeah, look at verse 19. It says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, blah, 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 right? So he's saying the seed here is the word of the kingdom. And actually in Luke's version of this, it says the seed is the word, the gospel uh, that is that is being spread. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's the word of God. It's, this, it's uh, uh, you know, Jesus is spreading the gospel. What's interesting here too is that Jesus is kind of the the sower and the seed, right? Because he is the word. He is uh, the word about him is being spread. Um, the other thing I'll just mention as an aside here is that we do not create the seed, right? The seed comes from Christ. The seed, the gospel is something that he has created. Uh, just like in the natural world, we don't create seeds. Uh, seeds come from uh uh, come from other plants, right? And we get seeds and we and we promulgate them. Um, it, it got me. Uh, it got me uh, spending too much time looking at um, these uh, seed banks that they have around the world, right? Where uh, you may have heard of the Doomsday Vault, you know, which has a a million seeds uh, of various varieties in them, right? Because because we cannot create seeds. Uh, seeds come from other plants, and we have to pass them on. So it's just an interesting. Uh, important thing for us to think about is this is not, uh, when we think about this seed, it's not something that we have to come up with. It's not something that we create. It is the the gospel. It is something that God has, has given to us, that Jesus has given to us, that we pass on. All right, so finally then, <clears throat> uh, so we got the sower, we got the seed. What is the soil? The hearts of people. The hearts, right? And you see that again in verse 19, even though we haven't read it, read it right, uh, the second half says, and he snatches away what was sown in his heart, right? So the, the soil the soil is the heart. Um, <clears throat> now, what's interesting here is that the, every, uh, you know, all hearts are the same. All soil is the same. It's all dirt. What's different is the condition of the soil or the, the preparation of the soil or you know the the what's around the soil right it's it's not that one soil is good and one soil is bad it's that the some soil has weeds some soil has been tramped down etc so it's interesting here that the soils are all the same really but but the condition of the soil and what has happened to the soil and what preparation has been made to the soil is all uh, what is make it made it different for the for the seeds that come to it? And again, what we're looking at here is how men respond to the gospel, right? How uh, how different people respond to the gospel. That's really what this message is all about. All right, so let's look at verse nineteen then in detail. <clears throat> when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. So again, the wayside, it's this hard packed down dirt, right? So this is the, this is the he hearer who ha is hard hearted, who is stiff necked, who is not paying attention, who is unconcerned. Um, you could also say the one who is careless and negligent. Uh, it's that hard packed soil that will not allow the seed uh, to penetrate. And then you have these, <clears throat> you have these, the, it says the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown. And if you go back to the verse four, right, it talks about the birds who come and devour them. So this is a picture of Satan. This is a picture of the wicked one, Satan, right, who comes and <clears throat> snatches away whatever truth has been given to uh, these people uh, quickly uh, gets taken away because they have not allowed it uh, to go deeply into their heart. So Satan does this right by uh, then filling their minds with earthly things, with cares, with concerns, with pride, whatever it is. And these these early thoughts, these early um, feelings or, 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 you know, penetrations, if you will, of the gospel are quickly taken away as Satan jumps in there and says, ah, oh, this is just a waste of time. Uh, you know, he sends false teachers. He sends uh, the fear 
of uh, you know what is somebody going to say if they think that you really believe this silly stuff pride jumps in there doubt maybe prejudice against uh, believers uh, and of course you know love of sin right uh, that that keeps people from uh, that makes the hard heart to begin with so they do not respond to the gospel um the, the the heart here shows no sense of repentance, right? Uh, it's interesting, you know, as you look at Proverbs. This is the this is the, the the fool that's described in Proverbs that says there is no God, hates knowledge, is hard hearted, will not hear. Uh, th this is the same person that we're talking about here. Um, I do want you to just show you. Um, go to First Corinthians a minute. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter two. First Corinthians two fourteen. It says, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned, right? So this is the hard-hearted man. It's all foolishness to him. He doesn't, he doesn't get it. He doesn't allow it to penetrate. He's he's built up this hard heart of uh, you know because of sin, because of rejecting, and because of the world, and, uh, and and it's all foolishness to him. Then go right over to Second Corinthians. There's a similar verse, Second Corinthians chapter four. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three. Mine says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them, right? The, the, the light of the gospel, the God of this age has blinded them. And this is, again, Satan's actions, right? Who comes in takes away whatever knowledge, whatever thoughts they have about Christ, he quickly dismisses them. He quickly comes in and undermines them uh, because they have not allowed that seed to uh, to get into soft, deep dirt, uh, i.e. into their heart. It just uh, gets uh, pushed away uh, by, by their uh, thinking. <clears throat> All right, so we got the wayside soil. Let's look at the next one then in verse 20. Hey, Rich. One. Yeah, go ahead. So what pops into my mind a little bit through that that discussion there with in the Matthew and those is how how does this line up with some of our, our Romans um, study when it, it almost sounds like or there's not any discussion here about God's impact on that and kind of some of God's selection. It almost sounds like Christ or like Satan has gotten to do what he wanted to here as opposed to God kind of opening the eyes of those that he chooses to open. Yeah, so let me say let me say a couple things here with regard to that. First of all, Scripture on a whole is balanced, right? But that doesn't mean that every scriptural verse is balanced, okay? So it doesn't have every every verse doesn't have everything in it. First of all, the second thing I the second thing I would say is, um, how does the soil get prepared? Is not talked about in this uh, in this passage, right? How does good soil become good soil? Right, such that is deep and ready, et cetera, et cetera. That I think would take us back to Romans and say God has to do something in order to get that hard packed soil uh, ready for the gospel. So that's where I think that, that the connection would be made. Does that make sense, CT? Uh, yep, yep, it helps me. Yep. But but again, I, I think that we, we can't. Uh, we got to be careful not to try to think the whole gospel is in every verse. Uh, that that will always get us in trouble of thinking, well, this doesn't talk about that piece, and that doesn't talk about that piece. It's not going to happen. Uh, he's he's trying to take take a particular. He, again, he's trying to encourage the disciples here to say, hey, not everyone who hears this message is going to react because 
God hasn't prepared all the the hearts. God has a prison for uh, you know there's not deep soil in uh, in all the people that you're going to be spreading this this word to. So all right, uh, verse 20, 21. <clears throat> but he who received the seed in stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately mm-hmm. he stumbles. So this, you know, this again gives us pause. So wait a minute, did somebody receive the word here and then they fall away from the word? Um, so, so what is it saying? He immediately receives it, but there was not a lot of thought involved. There was not a lot of um, counting the cost involved. This was a, a hasty profession, maybe an emotional profession. And everything that has occurred here is external, right? Um, this is the person who says, wow, this is great. I want to be a Christian too. It looks like they're all having a good time. And I can be, and hey, they're going to forgive my sins, and I get mercy and peace, and I get a clear conscience, and I get to belong in this fun place and get accepted. Everything's okay. The dilemma is, <laughs> the dilemma is that uh, we love these folks, right? They're the ones who get really excited about it and all pumped up. They're always talking about what happened to them. The problem is that because they don't actually know what they're doing (laughs) because they don't actually ponder it because there's no real true repentance and true brokenness and true contrition it's all just outer surface stuff their hearts are never impacted the hearts are still stony ground this is the this is the house built on the sand right there's no poor in spirit here, right? There's no breaking. It's just all about the good stuff. And this is where I think a lot of churches um, mess up, right? They they have a gospel call that's all about how much better things will be, uh, how good things will be, how you're going to get all this great stuff. But they don't talk about uh, bearing your cross. They don't talk about being poor in spirit. They don't talk about uh, repentance. And without repentance, there's no salvation. And these are these people. Um, when, Because then, notice it says, immediately it springs up and immediately it falls away. Right? It's a very short-lived kind of thing. When tribulation and persecution comes. So, so what's interesting is when tribulation and persecution comes, this is how we can often delineate those who are saved from those who are not. Because those, because either either deepens your faith and trust in God, or it burns you out, <laughs> and you and you leave. Right when the, when when tough times come, either you turn to God or you turn away from God, and that uh, that can often tell us then uh, true believers or non-believers. When the pressure comes from the world, or the pressure sometimes the pressure comes from other people in the church or the pressure of sin, uh, or persecution because somebody found out they were Christian, all of a sudden they get treated differently. And my, mine ends with, it says, immediately he stumbles, or immediately he's offended, immediately he falls away. So this is, a, so again, this is not a person who became a Christian and then falls away. This is someone who joined the church and uh, started uh, attending all the stuff, and then all of a sudden uh, the pressure came and they fell away. In order to, again, repentance is clearly an important important part of salvation, and you've got to have this deep sense of sin, of lostness, the desire for cleansing, self-denial, self-sacrifice, all that stuff is a part of it. And unfortunately, we, we... downplay a lot of that to new believers. And uh, unfortunately, then new believers do not become new believers. They just become new church attenders. There's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting example of this in scripture. Look at Mark chapter six. Name you'll recognize in Mark chapter six, verse 20. 
you see our good friend Herod in Mark chapter 6, verse 20. Uh, we can read it at 19. It says, therefore, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, wanted to kill John the Baptist, but he could not. Verse 20, for Herod feared John, knowing he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and he heard him gladly. Right? So here we have Herod. Uh, he was a church attender, right? He, he listened to John the Baptist. He he heard him gladly. He was he loved to hear about what he had to say until, of course, the pressure came and then he beheads him. Right. So here's a guy that you would say, man, if we could just get Herod on board, that would be great. What a what a what a, you know, what a difference he would make. Well, Herod, Herod then joins the church. He's on board until the pressure comes and all of a sudden. Uh, he cuts off John the Baptist's head. I think it's uh, it's a good, it's an important lesson for us in in uh, looking at Herod. All right, anybody else on the stony ground, or we'll move on to the thorny. Rich, wouldn't it also be like the rich young ruler who wants eternal life but doesn't consider the cost? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. You mean I have to give up this? Yep. Yep. And we'll see that even more, I think, when we go into the thorny ground, uh, you know, because that there you're you want someone who just wants to add Jesus to the rest of this stuff. Right. But yeah, that either one could fit in here. I think we certainly have here. You know, we often hear people say, gee, if so and so would just get saved, what a difference that would make. Right. And uh, often so and so is <laughs> is uh, is going to accept them only at the, uh, you know, I look good because I'm a Christian level. Uh, not uh, because I have a deep sense of, of my own sin. So, all right, let's go on to uh, the thorny, weedy ground then in verse 22. It says, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful, right? So this is all about worldliness, right? I do want to look at the other versions and Luke and Mark here a minute because they add some richness to this. So look at Luke chapter 8, <clears throat> where we have the same story. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. <laughs> I looked at 7, 14, and that was definitely not right. Uh, Luke 8, 14 says, Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they had heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity, right? So cares, riches, and pleasures. And then in Mark chapter 4, we see the story there. Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Mine says, in the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So it just gives you some other ideas of what he's talking about here, going back to now 1322. Um, right. He hears the word, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, uh, the pleasures of the world, other things uh, jump in. Right. So this is this is just the world. <laughs> this is somebody who. Uh, uh, you know, has uh, um, has the world, uh, thinks he wants to add Jesus to uh, his life uh, because he, again, he hears about all this good stuff that you get from it, but he only wants to add it on, right? He wants to add Christ to their pile of beliefs. Their beliefs are really about the world. The beliefs are really about how cool it is that I'm important. What a great job I have. What a great family I have. How beautiful I am. Right. I mean, it, it, it's just adding it on to the, the pleasures of the world. Um, they never again, there's no repentance. There's no cleaning out of the soil. There's no getting rid of the weeds. Uh, the soil is impure. There's no mourning over their sin. They just add Christ on. And I'll but, say it again. Go ahead. So at the end of the verse, it says becomes unfruitful. That mean at one point they were fruitful? No, it really just means that they're not fruitful. <laughs> they don't actually bear any fruit for Christ. 
No, it, it doesn't mean that they were once fruitful. It's just uh, the way that the thing is written here. I was just thinking, I mean, yeah, there was an article in the paper where there's a there's a pastor in our general vicinity who's got his fifth continuance on charges that were brought up over a year ago. And I just think about people that he may have influenced and were saved, but now he's become unfruitful. Just a just a thought. That's what popped in yeah. my mind. But I think this one is really talking about people that never become fruitful <laughs> because it, you know it's the seed that's planted, um, and it 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 uh, the plant comes up, but the world just just wipes out any kind of reality to that, right? It's not uh, it it doesn't become established, and it doesn't produce any fruit uh, because of that. So I, I'm not sure it's talking about that person, but I get your point. Um, so this person is trying to have the world and the word, right? Trying to have the world and Jesus. There's no examination of the soul. Um, you know, the other thing, remember, if you go back to um, uh, wherever it was, verse 7, right? The, the thorns spring up and choke them out. Um, remember, I, one of the comments I made there is that the weeds and the thorns are the natural plants for that area, right? And so it's the same way the world is the natural human uh, kind of response that people will have. It's the easy road. It's the wide way, right? The broad road. Um, it's the easy way. It, 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 it's, it's the natural environment uh, for the for these seeds. Whereas the, the uh, you know, the, the gospel is the narrow road, uh, requires some tending, requires some weeding, requires some work in order to get those plants to flourish. And I think this is, uh, these are not having that happen. And then, and then, you know, get to, 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 uh, to David's point about the, the fruit, right? Um, the, 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 it chokes out the fruit and it becomes unfruitful. Um, go, go to, again, I'm sorry, but I want you to go back to Luke chapter eight. Verse 14, or I can just read it to you. It says, now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity, right? So, David, it may be that they had fruit, but no fruit to maturity. Now, you know, when we talk about, uh, let me just hold that, but we're going to talk about fruit a lot when we get to the good soil here in a minute. But but the point is that th this fruit does not flourish. He does, does not have the fruit that is expected of them. I do want to look at one more passage here, though. Go to 1 John chapter 2, again to a familiar passage, but it is it is helpful in this context. 1 John chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 15. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Said, so do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of the Father abides forever. Right. So, so th this is what he's just talking about here. These are the thorns. These are the weeds. Right. The lust of the eyes. The pride of life blessed to the flesh, all of those things which the world presents to us, which choke out the reality of the gospel, which choke out real fruit. All right, so let's go to 23, and we're going to talk more about this fruit, because I think that's an important thing for us to understand, even what we've already talked about. So mine says in verse 23, but he who received the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. He who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, uh, Luke, uh, we won't go back there again, but Luke says those who are of a noble and good heart, or a um, honest and good heart, right? That dirt, uh, that good soil, and as you know, as we you know talked about earlier, that that soil that has been prepared. That soil that is ready for the deep uh, seed, that soil that God has 
prepared that God has gotten ready to hear and listen and understand those then understand it's not been hardened by sin it's been broken up uh, this person then thinks deeply on these things he he recognizes that he recognizes that the world must be subservient to his relationship with Christ right um, he understands the worth of the seed it's not hardened by sin but the, the point I got to make here is that the ultimate mark of salvation is fruitfulness. Is fruitfulness. That's the point he's made here over and over again, is that it bore fruit and the other places did not bear fruit. Uh, right. You had uh, <clears throat> you had ones that, that came up and withered away quickly before there was any free fruit. You had some that uh, um, that that got choked out before there was any fruit. And he's saying it really it's only here where you have the deep soil where the roots go down where it's broken up where people have true repentance that you actually produce fruit fruit is the ultimate mark of salvation now what is fruit can't hear you love joy peace long suffering yeah, so there's two different kinds of fruit, I think. <clears throat> and I think the first one is exactly what you said. It's the fruit of righteousness, right? The, 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 the righteous behavior, right? Love, joy, peace, all those things. It's got a character. There's a fruit that, that, that comes that is, uh, that, that is the, the characteristics of a Christian that a, that a person lives. And, and without that fruit, without seeing that fruit in a person, uh, you, you certainly can say, you know, that that person, uh, uh, you know, was, was either on the wayside soil or the rocky soil or the thorn soil, right? Because they did not produce that fruit. I think the other part of the fruit, however, is new believers, right? Because the seed, you plant the seed such to get more seed, right? You don't plant the seed uh, uh, just so that it looks good in the ground. Uh, you plant the seed so that you get more seed. Uh, the fruit here has got to be new believers. It's got to be, um, uh, you know, new new believers who understand that that is the very productive soil, uh, right? So when you talk about uh, this this uh, hundredfold increase or sixtyfold or tenfold, thirtyfold, right? I think he's talking about here that when the gospel is planted, that people will believe and they will understand. I think I don't I don't want to dismiss the idea of it's about righteous life and character, but I think the the emphasis that he's really putting on here is really on new people being saved. And so so some people have, uh, you know, some people produce 100 fold, some 60, some 30. Uh, why are there differences in what people produce as far as new believers? Any thoughts on that? Ask that question again, please. Uh, you know, it says here that some produce 100, some 60, some 30. Why is there differences in what people produce? It's the first, the first fruit that you talked referred to in Galatians. When you mature as a Christian, then you the more fruit becomes up as a result of that. Okay. Also, so why is there differences? Why doesn't have, everybody produce the same? We also have different callings in life. So gifting. I mean, so I would expect some missionaries are in a mission field where they you, you might see hundreds, thousands brought, and other missionaries might be in a field where they're only got three people that, you know, one or three people or same thing with pastors. I mean, everybody's in a different place at a different time. We all have different, we're just amongst different people. And then some of us are probably more obedient than others. Kind of snuck that in at the end there, didn't you see? <laughs> coming out of my heart. And I go, yeah. Oh, yeah, probably. I'm think that would be bad. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I think uh, you know. I think you all have captured it, right? I mean, I, I think that there's there's no question that God uses different people in different ways. Right. And, and so we just got to believe that. And that's true. God has different paths and different uh, opportunities and different callings on people's lives. No question about that. 
but you got to add that last sentence that CT. And I think that some people never live up to their potential uh, of what God expects of them, because you got to see here that everyone here, it says, produces 100 fold, 60 and 30, right? There's nobody there that produces zero <laughs> or, or, or two. Uh, it's uh, the minimum is 30. Um, and, and by the way, when you got a when you got a uh, you have a plant that's producing like this, you don't have to go and search for the fruit. It's not uh, hidden somewhere. It's, it's not some sneaky fruit, right? Um, and it's not, by the way, it's not beautiful foliage, right? It's not a great looking plant with no fruit on it. Uh, it's got to have fruit. <laughs> so I think this is a challenge to us. I just, you know, I, I don't want to belittle it, right? Yes, he uses us in different ways. Yes, uh, there are different gifts and talents and abilities and opportunities, but at the same time, I think to uh, disregard this idea of, uh, of uh, the impact that we have on other people's lives uh, would be a mistake, because I think he's saying here the minimum is, is 30, which is a huge amount, uh, a 30-fold increase in the seed. Now, you know, Rich, I, yeah. I think that um, we may not realize how much we have affected others because there's times when we may support others that may be more gifted in speaking and reaching out to others, you know, so there's and even yes. if it is personal with um, maybe somebody has only experienced that twice personally, directly saving somebody that's no less important than the one person that's done it to thousands, you know, right. so there's so many different ways that you know it all can happen <laughs> yeah and you know this gospel talks about right uh, some people water some people uh you know actually pull uh, pull the plant so uh yeah i absolutely agree with that uh, i'm not trying to make you feel bad i am trying to challenge you at the same time okay <laughs> um the other thing is uh the you get more plants the more seeds you sow right and not all seed uh, is going to produce good fruit. Not all seed is going to produce good plants. But you have to throw the seed. So we had a discussion on this in our Tuesday group some time ago, and that um, we're called to sow not part of the seed, but all of the seed. So 100%. You're to give 100%. No matter what the return is, you still sow 100 percent of the seed. Yeah, our, our job is not harvesting. Right. right? Our job is sowing. And, and again, as, as Debbie says, and we do that in many different ways, right? Uh, by the way we live our lives, by the, the attitude that we have, by the way that we react to people, by the way that we share the gospel, all of those things. <clears throat> But you, you get a better chance of hitting good soil uh, the more seed you throw. <laughs> By the way, the, the issue in this in the story is not the talent of the sower, right? Not the skill of the sower. It's the it's the quality of the seed, <laughs> which uh, again is not something that we create. It's something that's given to us. The issue is the 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 whether the soil is prepared, which is God's job, whether the seed is good, which is God's job, whether there's going to be a harvest, which is God's job, <laughs> right? Our job is to sow. Our job is to let our light shine, right? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're tools. We're the tools in the garden, I guess, is what I'm, um, because some sow, some water, I, you know, it, when, it, when you get to the harvest part, you can say, yeah, the Lord is the one who harvests, but he does that through, I'd say, a pastor or whatever, when they give these, he, all, all these allow, he allows us to be part of it. Um, I mean, I remember, I remember on my knees, the first guy that I think I helped lead to the Lord. And I, I you know, I stopped keeping count because of this verse and what Debbie said, there are other ways that you help people or show them you want this. The seed was sown, but if I live my life the way Christ would have me to, 
that may be the watering. That may be the next step to for the person who sowed the seed whenever. So, you know, we just we need to because I think Satan can use if we're counting. You know, well, golly, I'm at I'm at five. I got to get to thirty now. That's what Rich said in the scripture. I got twenty five to go, and I don't have that much time left. So, I think Satan can use that. To, to to work against us, but I do think that living your life, your heart, you got to have the right soil too. Have it to. I'm not getting kicked by my wife here that I'm rambling, but uh, I think I think we're we can. Uh, yeah, we're tools. He he allows us. He doesn't need us. We've always said that through every study we've done. He doesn't need us to do any of this. He could do it, but he allows us to be part of it. I agree. And you know, it's one of those things, don't get on either side of this, right? Don't don't uh use as an excuse, well, I live my life, so therefore I don't have to say anything. And right, you don't want to get on that side, and you don't want to get on the other side. Well, you know, I don't I've only got 29, I gotta go out and get that 30 and get another mark in my belt, right? That it's it's neither of those things, right? So good points. <clears throat> Let me just point out, was there something else? I'm uh, just going to mention the parable of the talents uh, and add some light to that. The, the master gave uh, three three servants different amounts of of money, and the one who who gave the two um, invested the money and and got a great return. The other one put it dug a hole and put it in the field, hid it, and uh, the two that one one had. I don't know what the numbers were, but the the one one servant had a large amount of money. The other servant had not that much money, but both were uh, rewarded as having uh, done equal work. So even though one made a lot more money, um, God regarded both of them, or the master regarded both of them as as equally useful. One more thing just to point out, and then we'll wrap in. Uh, <clears throat> make sure you see here the animal enemies of the gospel. You certainly see it in verse 19, right? The wicked one comes and snatches away. So Satan is, is active in trying to uh, uh, take get rid of the seed, right? In verse 21, right? It, uh, tribulation and persecution come, right? The, the pressure of the world, the pressure of uh, that, that comes on people often pushes them away from God. And then in uh, in verse 22, right, just the world itself and the cares of the world uh, are, are also enemies of the gospel. Th those are uh, three things that come up here against these seed uh, that that we we still deal with today as as people as we try to help people understand who who God is and what a relationship with Him is all about. All right, I think that is all for me today. Um, anything else? Any other comments before we? Get in the prayer requests. Figure out how. There we go. Point. Um, so is Hugh not there today? Is that why I not didn't see him? Right. Okay. So I'll just go ahead and we'll do the I'll do the prayer for us then. If somebody can help me get around the room. Stop recording. Stop recording. <laughs> One day I'll remember everything. It'll be amazing. Where are you, Bill? In heaven. <laughs>